Welcome back. I'm Speed at the bottom of the helix. Our next presenter is the chair of the NMRA Publications Committee and the editor of the Lone Star Region's Marker Lamp magazine. By day, he's an architect and professor of architectural history and design in Austin, Texas. Please welcome Riley Triggs. All right, thanks a lot, Speed. And thanks for having me today. Um, this is a, a great opportunity. I really appreciate it. So today I'm going to talk about my Port of New York Railroad layout, and I'm going to talk about it in terms of simplicity and how I was thinking about uh, designing not only the layout itself, but the operations as well. And everything that, that I've done on this layout has revolved around the idea of simplicity and being able to focus on uh, my priorities and get rid of the things that I don't really you know, care to do. So in my everyday life, I'm, I'm usually doing, you know, a hundred different things. Um, I, I've got a full-time day job as a project manager with, with our city public works department. Um, I teach in the evenings, um, architectural history and design studios. Um, I do a lot of volunteer things, um, you know, president of, of one of our local modular railroad clubs. Uh, in addition to the things that I'm doing with the national publications and publishing the, the marker lamp for my region. So I'm a busy guy. I got a lot of things going on. And so in, in my downtime, um, the downtime that I do have to spend on my layout, I need to make sure that I'm really focused on the things that I want to do and I don't end up, you know, wasting my time on things that I'm not really that interested in. So when I was thinking about uh, this layout and, and how it actually go about building it, um, I looked to um, a designer from the MIT Media Lab named John Maida. And he came up with this, uh, this set of laws revolving around simplicity having to do with how you approach design. And his first law is about reduction. Um, what you want to do is the, you know, the simplest way to achieve uh, simplicity is through reduction. So reducing the things out of your life, out of a design uh, that don't really support it, that don't really do the things that you want to do. The second thing is organize. Uh, you know, uh, organization is basically what design is. And so the better organized you are with what you're doing, the better your design is going to be. The third one is time. Now, you, you don't want to spend a lot of your time uh, doing things you don't want to do. Uh, and you want to be able to focus on the things that you do. So learning, it's always a learning process, right? You're, you're always going to be in there trying to figure out how to do these things better and whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, the more that you learn, the simpler you can be with what you're doing. Uh, you just get better at it. And then differences. Having a difference between uh, simplicity and complexity is really important. Having the simplicity is what allows you to have the complexity. And so you're, uh, so again, you can focus on the things that you want to and you can develop more fully the things that you want to be complex and that you want to really involve yourself in. In my case, that's going to be operations we talk about later. And then context. Um, so the context of, of simplicity, um, you know, can include not only those very things that you're focusing on, but larger issues and things that are kind of at the periphery or just outside of uh, exactly what you're doing. So you don't want to lose sight of those at all. And then emotion is number seven. Um, being able to, um, to express some things and be able to feel some things while you are participating in whatever it is that you're doing, in my case, uh, operating a model railroad, um, the better it's going to be and the more focused and simple you need to be to achieve that. And then number eight is trust. Kind of goes along with, with any sort of set of precepts. You want to trust the process. You want to trust the idea of simplicity and use it to its fullest and get the most out of it. And then failure. It's okay to fail. Uh, you just want to fail quickly so that you can move on, you can do things right. And then number 10, you want to subtract and then add. So you want to subtract out everything uh, that you, you don't need um, and then add back the things that you do. So in my case, one of the big things that, that I want to subtract from this and reduce out of my layout is wiring. And we've all seen layouts like this. 
Uh, we've all seen control panels like this. And, uh, you know, this is some amazing work. It takes a long time. Um, uh, it's very complex. Um, it's very, you know, heavy technology, et cetera, and very impressive. I'm just not interested in doing it myself. Um, I just don't have the time to, to do this. I want to play with my trains. The other thing is track clean. Um, we've all experienced this. You know, there's a million different ways to clean track because we've got to do it all the time. Um, it's, uh, it's a, it's usually a deal killer, uh, you know, during an operating session, as soon as you have some people over, that's when you're going to find the dirty track. Um, and it takes time to, you know, prepare properly. And if you have a larger layout, of course, you've got, uh, you've got all the track and all the wheels on your locomotives and, um, you know, it becomes a, a pretty big task in and of itself. So to take care of those two things, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I want to reduce those, those complexities. Uh, I'm using radio control and battery power, uh, battery power locomotives and then radio control throttles. This involves putting the, the power, uh, you know, putting the battery, putting a receiver and, um, and your and on off switch uh, into your locomotive consist uh, and then hooking up to a regular um, sound decoder in my case um, and then operating from a throttle. This provides, you know, a really nice, neat, clean, um, simple uh, solution to powering your locomotives. So I'm no longer cleaning track. Uh, I don't have any shorts. Um, there's, uh, uh, you know, the, the biggest um, problem is that these locomotives keep running and running and running. So I use momentum. And whenever I have people over to operate, the first thing I tell them is it's okay to touch the equipment. Uh, I'd much rather you grab the locomotive than watch it sail off the end of the layout. So by reducing the wiring, uh, worrying about track cleaning, all that sort of stuff, now I can concentrate on running my locomotive. Uh, switch control. Um, you know, this is another huge area that you get into. All the complexities of the wiring, the logic, the control panels, um, all of that is stuff that I just simply don't have time to do or else I would still, you know, be, be underneath my layout. Hours and hours of wiring up, pre-wiring tortoise engines, pre-mounting uh, to make the process simpler. But again, um, that's not what I'm interested in. And so I use just simple Pico code, um, code 70 uh, switches, um, operate them with my finger. Uh, so far in the past, um, you know, eight or nine years that I've been operating, you know, no problem whatsoever with any of this. It also kind of forces you to um, make sure that all of your track is accessible on your layout. Uh, this doesn't work if you have hidden track or a track that's out of reach. And uh, so it helps make a, a better operating layout there too. And again, no shorts, uh, no complicated wiring to get this to work, uh, you know, with DCC or, or DC uh, locomotives. And it's just another way to simplify things. Uh, lighting, uh, I mean, no signaling. So um, my particular prototype, one of the reasons why I chose it was because it is an industrial switching layout and doesn't have any signaling. So all of the stuff that goes along with that, the wiring, the control panels, the logic, the computers, all of that goes away. And then even down to, you know, things having to do with the layout and lighting. Uh, you know, I've, I've spent countless hours helping people install lights and try to figure out, you know, the right kind of light and, and building things and whatnot. And here, you know, I, I try to take that as simple as possible. It's like, what are the main elements that I need? I need something to put them on. I need something, you know, to hang them. I want them to be a minimal impact on the visuals of the room. And so just uh, LED strip lights in a, you know, Home Depot $10 piece of aluminum angle. Uh, suspended from some uh, some twisted cable, um, and it's 30 minutes to put it up, and it costs you know about $30. So again, simplicity, driving the design, and saving me time, saving me money, etc. And then no electronics. You know, I don't have CTC again because of the prototype that I chose. Of, of course, you know this wouldn't work if I'm doing a mainline prototype um, that use CTC or train control um, in the prototype. Uh, I'm very dedicated to prototype modeling. And so of course that wouldn't work. 
Uh, but that's one of the things that told me what I can do, what I can model. And that became one of my uh, pretty strong constraints, not having to, to have something like this to deal with or maintain. And then during operating, uh, operations is really what I've geared my layout towards and what I'm really interested in doing. And, uh, and you know, this, this could be, uh, you know, several hours of clinics back to back to back on what the best way to operate is. Um, I, I grew up in model railroading using car card system and it works really well, but it's, um, it's more complicated than just having a switch list and handing out a switch list where somebody has one piece of paper and written on it is everything they need to do. And they don't have to carry around, um, you know, a pack of cards that they're inevitably going to drop or, you know, they need an apron or a pocket to put it in or et cetera. Um, so this is a big one as well. And along with that, uh, in my yard, I, I'm trying to use, uh, haven't been real successful yet, um, I'm trying to use wheel reports or, or track report um, type organization. So I'm not dealing with a bunch of car cards with a bunch of different pockets and you know, constantly trying to match up what's going where and, uh, and having that extra paperwork. I keep track of this on a piece of paper um, and you know, list the tracks and list what's on each track and where it's going and make up the switch list from there. And then those things, of course, during an operating session will be constantly rotating and, uh, you know, things moving in and out. So the priorities for my layout. Um, this is something that I, I worked really hard on. Um, you know, I, I've been fortunate to experience a whole bunch of different wonderful layouts all over the place. Uh, many, you know, many of them would be just great for me, but, um, but what I had to do is say, what are the most important things? What are, what are the priorities that I know how to reduce, how to uh, subtract things from what I need to do, how I need to simplify uh, and really enjoy what I'm doing? So those came down to, to three things. Operation is the number one thing. Uh, definitely uh, you know, want to operate this layout. Uh, I started operating it before I finished laying the track. Um, you know, I haven't even done scenery yet or anything, but I'm operating in there, um, having a lot of fun doing it. Prototype rigor is another one. I, I wanted to be able to model something uh, in its entirety. I wanted to be as faithful to the prototype as possible in terms of, you know, scale, in terms of uh, having each industry, um, having as, as close a prototype track arrangement as possible. Um, and so I needed something that I could handle and um, I could research and apply to uh, the situation that I had. And then the other big one is low maintenance. Again, going back to wiring, track cleaning, shorts, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, I just don't have a lot of time and uh, a lot of help to go around maintaining something all the time. So as simple as I can make it, uh, the better so that I can handle it and spend more of my time on my other priorities, operation and prototype rigor. So to select the prototype, um, I came up with um, a, a set of constraints uh, that matched what my priorities were. So number one is I wanted to model the entire railroad. Um, I didn't want to try to do like a transcontinental railroad in um, 500 square feet of, of a house. Um, you know, you can't do, do the prototype justice. Uh, it's a different type of railroading or model railroading. It's, um, uh, you know, a grander scale. And what I wanted was to actually get in there and do lots of switching. And so industrial type layouts um, obviously do that a lot um, and uh, fit the space that I have and the time that I have, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing that I really like the first generation diesels. Um, I just, I, I love the little guys. Uh, I think they're amazing. And so I wanted to be able to set my, my prototype in that era of first generation. And then I wanted to have a significant yard. Um, being a yard master is one of the things that I really like to do. Um, and, and I think it tells a lot about a railroading story to be able to have a yard so that you have the yard generating the traffic, accepting the traffic, and, uh, and you get a sense of how an entire railroad works. And that's one of the reasons why um, you know, I wanted to model an entire railroad so I could see how all those things work together uh, and how each component of a railroad uh, works. And then an urban setting. 
I'm an architect. I love buildings. Uh, I love the idea of uh, cars going, you know, rail cars going inside of buildings. Uh, I just think there's something magical about that. Uh, also street running, um, you know, the idea of, of trains and cars in the same space, uh, I always thought was, was pretty cool. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that I was able to do some of that in the layout that I chose to do. And then car floats is the last thing. Again, kind of a, a magical railroading thing to me, seeing these, you know, huge rail cars go on car floats uh, out in the middle of a, a huge body of water. It's just an unusual thing. It's a neat thing. Uh, and so I wanted to incorporate that into my layout. The constraints that I had, uh, space was number one, uh, had about 500 square feet of space that I could use. And then I say plus some, um, because there were a couple of times that my wife went out of town and, and they expanded beyond that. So I'm really out more 800, 850 square feet uh, of railroad uh, that I'm working with now. And then of course, budget, um, leisure time is a big thing, like I said. Uh, being a one-man show and keeping it simple are really important because of, of all of those things. So I went around the country um, looking for a prototype that would match my priorities and uh, fit within my constraints. And a location that I hit upon uh, is just um, ripe with possibilities to fit any of those priorities or all the priorities and all of my constraints. And this was the area in and around New York City uh, in the port of New York. Um, so New York, New Jersey, uh, where the big railroads came and terminated and, and floated across to Manhattan uh, to service the, the huge city of New York. Um, so this is a great place for finding the industrial railroads, small things that you can model the entire entirety of the railroad and, uh, and then a variety too. Uh, you know, every major railroad on the East Coast came here somehow. Uh, and so I've got a lifetime of buying uh, locomotives of different uh, railroads if I want to. And so in particular, I was looking for um, uh, a couple of things. The, the Erie Railroad uh, has always struck me as being interesting and, and has been um, a, a research passion of mine for a while. And so anything that was Erie rail, Railroad oriented or connected to or whatever um, was you know, kind of where I started in my look, and I quickly came across the Hoboken Shore, um, and then, of course, a couple of uh, stations that the Erie had around here as well. Uh, the other one uh, that I'm modeling now is the 27th Street Station for the Lehigh Valley, uh, which is in close proximity to, to all of this. Um, so, being along the uh, the Harlem, or there's the, the Hudson River uh, is the thing that, that my railroad floats across right now. Uh, there's also the East River, the Harlem River, um, lots of opportunities for car floats, big city, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is the setting for my layout and I knew I could find something to model here. And, um, and so my space, um, there's basically one big room um, where the, the Hoboken Shore uh, lives. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, there are a couple of times my wife went out of town and, and the layout has grown out here into these rotating pocket terminal areas out in the, uh, the hallway. Um, and this, um, this is a really neat way to be able to keep building and experiencing different prototype railroads by building these modules, basically light and movable. So I can just, I can swap these out and, uh, you know, keep building and keep enjoying that part of the hobby for, Ever, really. Um, there are so many uh, railroads uh, operating along here and so many of these pocket terminals that I'll never run out of opportunities. So the first bit, uh, we'll start out in those pocket terminals. The 27th Street Station is a Lehigh Valley Railroad um, on the island of Manhattan. And this was a really, uh, really interesting situation. And the reason why I chose it was again, you know, one of my uh, interests is in buildings and pairing railroads with big buildings in a big city um, really had me excited. So this building, the, the Star at Lehigh building, um, famous building uh, on the island of New York. Um, uh, it's on the, the National Register of Historic Places now. It's just been renovated and is looking really good. Uh, but one of the cool things they had in it were truck elevators. And so, 
the, the railroad occupies the ground floor and would offload uh, into trucks and, um, and into the warehouses above and the trucks could go up and down and uh, fill up and go out into the streets of Manhattan from there. So really interesting uh, situation um, and a really great modeling challenge. Uh, so some of the upper floors, uh, this is real, real well documented because it is on the National Register. Uh, but just to give you an idea, there's you know so much going on in, in this building, and it's a it's like a 14, 16 story building that's going to be pretty tall on HO scale. The other terminal that I'm doing is the Harlem Station for the Erie Railroad, and um, it's also called the 149th Street Station, and that's over in the Bronx, just um, a couple of blocks away from the original site of Yankee Stadium. Look like this uh, from the air in the um, probably late 50s. Uh, had some, you know, great, really first generation diesels, the, the box cabs from Ingersoll Rand and GE. And this, this um, terminal operated, you know, well into uh, the 60s, maybe the 70s as well. I don't, I don't recall. Uh, when the cutoff was, uh, but lots of changes, of course, through the years, but, uh, but a bustling hub of activity. And um, this is a photo that was used in, uh, I think it was a John Armstrong book, and then also it was in an NMRA calendar one year. Uh, but you can see just all the possibilities for what's going on with a little freight station, with a car float, uh, offloading bulk uh, goods like uh, coal, um, you know, a really interesting, uh, bustling little terminal, and, uh, and it's not very big. Um, these are some uh, historic maps um, put together from different places, uh, they're different times, different and varying levels of uh, uh, exactness, and uh, so I had to kind of cobble together what I thought was what actually happened during my time period. And then coming up with, you know, plans and whatnot to build it, figuring out um, how these things were, um, you know, were going to be scenic and et cetera. So again, what happened, my, my wife went out of town one weekend and uh, I wanted to build one of these, but I had no place to put it. And so uh, I thought, oh, well, there's a space over the stairway that I'm not using. Um, and so I, I built it up there. And when my wife came home, she went up the stairs and she was like, oh, this is weird. The stairs are kind of dark. And of course it was casting a shadow and, um, uh, and she was um, surprised when she got to the top, but hasn't complained too much because it's still there. And it's a really small pocket terminal, five feet by seven feet. And, uh, and you get a lot of action here. You know, somebody, somebody can operate this, uh, takes, you know, about 45 minutes. Uh, to offload and onload um, the float. Um, and it's a, it's a real great uh, beginner's sort of operation experience. And again, it's, it's small and portable and I can replace it with a different one later on if I choose. And then the, the main layout room is taken up by the Hoboken Shore Railroad and its connection to the Erie in Weehawken. So this is an overall aerial view of it and the map of it. Um, I found a, a really great book of um, all of the maps of New York Harbor of all the terminals that was done by uh, the Corps of Engineers back in the late 1930s and have, you know, just excellent reference materials for uh, buildings, industries, and track arrangements. Hoboken is, you know, the, the famous square mile town. Um, it's not very big, but uh, a lot of things uh, came and went through there. Uh, inventions, um, uh, people like Frank Sinatra. Uh, so a really interesting place um, to look at and interesting railroading too going on, not only in it, but adjacent to it with the Erie and the Lackawanna. Referencing maps, uh, every map that I can find on it has something new and uh, potentially something interesting that I can add to the layout or, or choose to ignore, obviously. Um, some great library maps uh, from the 30s showing, you know, everything um, that one would need to know to figure out how to design a layout. So the first thing I did was take pencil to paper and sketched out the area and, you know, was trying to match all of that to uh, the constraints of space that I had. And in doing so, I designed it 
um, according to operating positions. So, so I wanted to make sure that there was plenty of room. Um, you know, we, we wouldn't be bumping butts. We wouldn't be uh, getting in each other's way while these different positions were operating. And so I kind of had to figure out the operating scheme before I even did the track plan. Here's a view um, of a few years ago of the room just to give you a sense uh, of what it's like. Uh, a lot has changed uh, with it, um, but it's still basically you know, the same arrangement. Of course, the bench work is in the same place. So just going through um, uh, the Hoboken Shore uh, track and the industries that were around that, starting in Weehawken, which is where it um, hooked up with the Erie Railroad and had a little transfer yard. Uh, there are shipyards here. Um, the Erie had uh, a really big uh, uh, operation there. You can see all the, the crates lined up. Here's a, a reverse view of the same area uh, showing just how bustling it was. This was, um, this might have been during wartime. I uh, don't remember exactly when it was or maybe a little bit afterwards. Uh, so still a very active, busy place. And of course, the view of Manhattan in the background. Um, unfortunately, my layout faces the other way, so I can't have that as a backdrop, but that would be amazing. So here's how it translates into the track arrangement. Um, the, the upper right-hand side is the, the little interchange with the Erie, and so Erie comes out and moves into this first yard that's in the center um, and then wraps around uh, the corner just like it does in the map. One of the industries nearby is U.S. testing, which later became, you know, uh, like underwriters laboratory where they test consumer products, make sure they're safe and, um, and they do what they're supposed to do. Uh, found some great, I think this is from um, the ICC maps, uh, Interstate Commerce Commission in the 20s. Uh, they went around and um, evaluated um, all the railroads and their property. Great source of information. In the background is the Lipton T building. And this is uh, just on the, the dock um, by the tracks, testing out a Black & Decker handsaw. They tested mattresses, pretty unique way of testing mattresses. Uh, and then right across the way is um, uh, Franklin Bakers, um, which became General Foods at one point. And then the Hoboken Shore engine terminal there is uh, on the left as well. Neat little way to get in and out of an engine house. Here's the, the Franklin Baker uh, multi-story building. And then a reverse view of that, this is looking at uh, the same area of the yard uh, back towards Franklin Baker there. So this is how it turns a corner. Um, so the yard actually follows pretty closely what, uh, what happens in the map and on the track charts from the prototype. Lipton T is the next building. This is a, a massive building, which has now been turned into luxury lofts uh, right on the river overlooking Manhattan and the Empire State Building. Um, Hoboken Yard is to the left at the bottom. Uh, an iconic sign uh, to be read from uh, across the river. Um, and uh, of course, lots of advertising and billboards in, uh, in the 40s and 50s around the area and across the United States. So this is how it translates into the layout. The, um, on the bottom right is where the engine house is and some unique track work to kind of get across and into that. Then there's Lipton's T, which is a 14 story building. Um, and I can't model all of it, but, uh, but you can get a sense of uh, the proportion and the scale with the, the rail cars. And it's, it's quite an imposing presence when you're operating next to it, which is neat. So the yard itself, this is right next to Lipton T uh, and shows the complexity of uh, the track arrangements. Uh, industries are back to the right down at the bottom behind the engine house. Um, and there's a little bit of storage to the left and then curving off to the upper right uh, is going on to the rest of the railroad. This is where they took all of their, their hero pictures of their locomotives, so uh, you often see the same buildings in the background. It's a little 44 tonner. They had a couple of these. And then a roster of the rest of um, uh, their locomotives pre 44 tonners and pre looks like pre uh, HH 600 as well. So in the yard right behind the um, 
the engine terminal, uh, several industries. There's Kelly Springfield Tire, Continental Baking, which made Hostess Twinkies. And here's the, uh, the side of the engine house. Complexity in the track work. Um, over on the, the Erie side of the yard, there are these, uh, this ladder of intermediate um, slip switches, um, which takes a while to get used to and understand how to get through there successfully. Moving around from Lipton right in front of that, uh, Pier 16 and C Train, uh, which was a really interesting operation. Uh, this was the precursor to container shipping. The, instead of having containers, they just put the whole rail cars on here and they went between uh, New Jersey, um, Havana, Cuba, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, maybe even gone into Texas too. Um, don't remember that, but maybe into Galveston. Uh, but this really revolutionized shipping. And so C train is off to the left there, right by the Lipton T building. And as we move around, uh, move around the corner, uh, we start to get into Bethlehem Steel, um, General Foods, Maxwell House Plant, and on around Stevens Institute. So here's an aerial view that uh, shows all of the uh, the rest of the railroad and um, you know how it kind of snakes along the, the shore of the river, which is really cool, um, and all the different industries and, and places that are serviced by the Hoboken shore. On the way down there, 11th Street um, had some you know walk-up brownstone tenement type buildings. Um, uh, I'm going to able, be able to model one of these streets. And here are some of the ruffians that hang out. Uh, Hoboken was a pretty rough place. That's something that I, I want to model as well. And here's how it's translating. I, I'm doing massing models for uh, all of my buildings so uh, that I can get the scale right. Uh, you know, there's going to be adjustments um, because I'm, I'm modeling it and not able to do full size, et cetera, uh, compression and uh, just how it works with the space and with operating as well. But at the end of that street, um, there's a plaque where uh, they commemorate the playing of the first professional baseball game uh, in the Lycian Fields. So here's that intersection, and um, I'm translating my design onto uh, the plywood. So the baseball plaque marker has its, has its spot. Uh, I know there was a mailbox there. On the other side, there's a light pole, um, fire hydrant, um, and then you know, the, the grass median. And then across the street is Bethlehem Shipyards. This was the site of several um, high profile strikes in the 40s and 50s. Um, and some uh, historic uh, photos um, from uh, preservationists and National Register uh, getting inside and actually seeing how these, these buildings were made, uh, quite interesting, interesting. And then also there's uh, these little electric trucks that uh, when I heard about these referenced, I thought they were like big trucks that, you know, you got in and you drove around, uh, but found this picture. Um, and this led me to uh, connect to um, an interview that was done with uh, someone who worked on the railroad talking about collecting these electric trucks uh, at the end of the night, charging them up overnight in the yard, and then redistributing them um, first thing in the morning. So there I have a really neat, um, very unique operational element. Here's the track arrangement of that area. This is Bethlehem uh, Shipyards down at the bottom. Uh, this turn back curve uh, is not exactly prototypical, but the railroad does curve there. And then uh, Maxwell House Coffee is there in the background and you'll see some mock-up buildings as well. So this is looking back, Bethlehem Steel is uh, in the foreground uh, and these are all uh, residential um, walk-ups that perform a you know natural view block from the other aisle. Maxwell House Coffee is next. Have some great maps uh, showing the track arrangement there, and this is something where um, uh, you know I wanted to operate first before I started getting into this because I did move some track around, and then this is what it's looking like now with uh, the mock-ups in place. Next is the uh, marine float yard and float yard. 
some historic photos of that, how it translates into the track plan. Here's the float yard on the left, float up in the, the top left there. And again, amazing views of the Empire State Building and Manhattan skyline, uh, just to kind of set the setting. And again, the view block between aisles. USDA inspection was towards the end of the line. Uh, I found a, a blueprint of this, um, so I can have a nice building flat that represents that. And this is also a space where, uh, you know, interesting operation happens. A couple of these refrigerated cars uh, come in and out. Um, I've, I've determined that it takes 20 minutes to inspect them and load them up with a little bit more ice if necessary. Uh, so operators rotate things out of this while they're operating my dock job. And then the two piers, the American Export and Holland American piers, represented by some interesting uh, track arrangements here. So you, you have to uh, be careful what you uh, have on the front and the back of your locomotive to get them in the right spot. And then creating buildings that uh, are accessible for operations, yet still give you an idea of the building and the feeling for operating within a building. And here's the Holland American line. And in the background there, this is uh, Campbell Stores. Um, of course, on a, on a layout, you're limited by space, but I, I want to get these buildings in there because it's so much a part of the character of what's going on. So as part of the, you know, the list of uh, achieving simplicity, you know, the last one is uh, you know, subtracting, uh, but adding back complexity and things that you wanna do. And for me, that's, that's operations. So what I've done is I've, I've created a little game that I call Break Bin and uh, started out using just wire nuts um, and um, you know, have them represent the brakemen and the employees that were down on the ground actually doing the work of the railroad. Now I'm using these little figures uh, as my little mock-up. Um, I've been able to find out names of the people who operated um, you know, on these railroads uh, and was inspired by Jim Sinisi in Tulsa uh, about, um, you know, modeling the, the railroad itself and the people. And so the people and what they do became really important to me um, to have operators understand during one of my sessions. So this game developed in order to put you into um, the layout and operating as if you're on a real railroad. So here's a little example. Uh, train pulls into uh, a spot um, and um, and you use the the brakeman um, to represent what the actions are that they would have to to do and, and roughly where they would have to be so if anything needs to be done these guys need to be uh, on the ground uh, in the area of the the place that the thing is happening um, so what this does I'm not trying to model time um, although it does slow down operations quite a bit, I'm not worried about how long it takes to walk from place to place or uncouple or whatever. Um, it's more about the action and it's more about just accounting for and becoming part uh, of that recreation of operations. So at switches, guy needs to be next to the switch so he can throw the switch. Trains can move forward. Switch gets thrown. Train backs up. You know, there's still a guy riding on that because he's going to be the one that is doing the coupling and the uncoupling. So he gets down on the ground and, um, and doesn't necessarily need to be like right on top of what's happening, but kind of in the area. So think of it as like a double play uh, in baseball where you need to be in the area of the bag in order to make the out. So move forward. Switch gets thrown. Guy's still on the ground. Goes back up, drops the other car, gets back on, and then um, you know throw the last switch. Guy gets on, and away you go. So the rules of this game are that the crew must be at the point of action. Uh, it's not so much about the time of the activity, but just recognizing that people are doing this and what the activities are. And then again, that kind of in the area double play sort of thing. As long as you're within the uncoupling stick width or length. Uh, you're just fine. Um, it's, it's, it's not meant to be tedious. It's meant to just uh, get you into the moment and into the scene. So the crew can walk, but they really don't like to walk very far. They're, they're lazy um, and uh, 
you know, it's probably hot out there. So be kind to your crew when you're operating. So the things that they need to be on the ground for, coupling and uncoupling, throwing a switch, placing or picking up a derail, using a phone box, delivering waybills, opening and closing gates. There are a lot of gates in this industrial layout. So that'll be something that um, one would have to actually operate, set fuses or, or anything else. So that's, that's how I've translated uh, the prototype into my layout and into my model railroad. Um, and all along the way, I was using these laws of simplicity of reducing and organizing. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't go through a lot of the other ones, but the big one is subtract and then add. Uh, you know, the whole idea is that you want to get rid of the stuff that doesn't meet your priorities, that isn't really what you want to do, that, you know, time is precious. And so do, do what you, you want to do. Um, and make sure you add back that level of complexity that the simplicity makes room for, and then you can have some fun. And in my case, it's, uh, it's operations. Uh, in your case, it may be super detailing scenes. It may be, you know, painting locomotives or maybe, you know, whatever, uh, but allow yourself room, you know, you're, you're your own permission giver. So you can, uh, you can decide what's important and what's not in your layout. And then when it comes down to the, um, the whole idea is that, um, the simplicity allows you to operate and maintain your layout and enjoy your layout. And then on top of that, you want to be able to, to add those things that make it enjoyable for your visitors and your operators uh, when they come over and uh, play trains with you. So that's my approach uh, to my layout. As you see, I'm kind of uh, still building it. Uh, my next step is to turn some of those mock-ups into actual prototype buildings. You see, I'm going to be working from prototype photos. Uh, I'm going to be 3D modeling and laser cutting things so that I can basically create my own kits um, and, uh, and be as faithful to the prototype as I want. Again, I would rather do that than do wiring um, or signal maintaining on my layout. So it's all about figuring out what your priorities are and uh, allowing yourself uh, the space to do what you enjoy to do. So that's, that's what I got, Speed. Those who missed it, do you model, model a specific year? Um, I do model 1959. And that came about uh, because it was the last year that the Erie Railroad was independent. And when I, when I first started uh, trying to decide what to model, um, I, again, I kind of latched onto the Erie. I did a lot of research on the Erie. And, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of model, model railroaders um, overbuy and then have to go through and sell or trade or whatever. And I didn't want to go through that hassle. And so I decided, well, if I just, if I set that market 1959, I'm going to hit, you know, first generation diesels that I like. Uh, and then also I don't have to worry about um, if the, the, the prototype existed, uh, you know, if it was proper for my era. And then when I got into the Hoboken Shore in 1959, just, it turned out to be a, an interesting year anyway. Um, and so that's what I'm modeling right now with, with an eye towards being able to backdate um, and get into some of the steam locomotives. Um, and, you know, they even have electric locomotives before that. Um, so that, that would be fun to, to play with. But 1959 right now. Cool. Um, how many operators can you uh, host there? Uh, I, can, I, I can operate from 1 to 11 people at a time. Uh, and this is a big part of my, not only my, my layout design and the prototype that I chose, but also the operational scheme uh, that I've been going for. Um, I wanted to be able to, to host, you know, varying um, sizes of groups coming over, uh, but I also wanted to have varying levels of complexity. And so, uh, you know, I, I can take a train out, operate it, um, take it back to the yard and it, it doesn't have any, you know, consequences on anything else. And I can just move through the schedule and it works just fine for one. Um, and if I want to have 11 people, uh, I double up on crews, you know, I have a, an engineer and a conductor, um, then they can get into uh, more of the brakeman game and get more into the complexity, which again matches, or I want to match up with the um, experience level of the operators. So kind of going from, uh, you know, one, a novice to four, an expert, 
um, creating things that can be done at all different levels so that anybody can come over and feel comfortable and enjoy themselves. And it's not like you're overburdening them with the paperwork, right? Not overburdened with paperwork. They get a switch list. That's it. And a pencil. Um, pencil is even optional. Uh, but yeah, you go out with a throttle, uh, a switch list, and a pencil and a pick, and you just do your thing. So uh, I definitely wanted the you know the emphasis to be on um, maximizing operating time. And so the switching layout does that. Um, the you know the the lack of all the the other stuff to take care of and learning how to you know throw switches or uh, operate control panels or any of that sort of thing gets eliminated and people can dive in and spend all their time operating. So my operating sessions are set up um, so that if you wanted to, you can operate you know three hours straight. Um, but it's also uh, flexible. So if you want to operate for a little bit, sit down for a little bit come back and operate, that works fine too. And that's that, that all comes about because um, I was thinking about that to begin with and design the entire layout and the operating scheme uh, to accommodate that. Pretty cool. So a few technology questions. Why battery right. powered? What drew you to that? What was the question about battery power? Why did you uh, indulge into uh, battery power? Ah, uh, to eliminate all the wiring and okay. track cleaning and um, kind of all the problems associated with that like shorts and um, you know complicated wiring at switches and all that uh, now i do you know a little bit of wiring between the locomotive and you know the, the circuit board and the battery mm -hmm. i do that once and you know in an hour i can use that locomotive and don't have to worry about um, you know cleaning wheels or track or anything you know after that um, all I have to do is charge the batteries, obviously, and the batteries that I'm using, and actually the batteries have gotten better in the past few years uh, since I've done this. And now with, you know, a small battery that can fit inside of a large locomotive, um, you know, you can operate for four hours easily. Um, and uh, so it's just charging in between sessions and charging, um, you know, it depends on, on the battery, but it's like 45 minutes to an hour to charge each one on a really slow trickle, which um, keeps the battery healthy and, and adds to the longevity of it. So it's, it's very low maintenance. Um, uh, and, you know, getting ready for an operating session, I, I spend, you know, whenever I'm like at my desk, um, I just hook one up to, to charge up. And, you know, uh, when the timer goes off, I, you know, flip it to the next one. Um, and don't have to worry about cleaning track or any of that sort of thing. Um, you know, the other part of you know, getting ready for an operating session is filling out the switch list. And I've gotten to the point where, you know, since I don't have to worry about the car cards, you know, I have to worry about matching up cars and, and, and cards um, and flipping weight bills and, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, it only takes me a couple of hours to stage the entire railroad. And, you know, there, there are several jobs, you know, there's the, the two terminals, there's, um, there's four jobs that happen um, on the Hoboken shore, plus a couple of people in the yard. Um, and so I can, I can do a whole scheme in a couple of hours, uninterrupted hours, um, and be ready for an operating session and just have, you know, a small thin stack of switch lists and away we go. So you do disconnect the batteries and charge them somewhere yeah. else yes uh, ever thought of a charging track you could... the system that i use is the the airwire system from cvp which does not support that at the moment there are other brands like uh, the stanton system the s cab uh, you can uh, have it charge from the track and so i know some people who um, have you know certain areas of their layout that they've wired up so you can just park your locomotive and it trickle charges and, um, you know, does it automatically. So that's, that's a, a neat option uh, and a neat way to do it. Um, I do have to, you know, physically handle my locomotives and, and hook up the battery in between sessions. But again, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a very, it's a minuscule chore compared to everything else that I would have to do. Okay. On to the operations part. How do you connect the car floats to your layout? Uh, at the point, uh, right, right now, uh, at the moment, they are hard connected. 
So they're actually, you know, the, the rails are soldered together and it's a nice, good connection. Um, but the idea is that um, I've got the, the float at Hoboken Shore that would go to the pocket terminals and back. Uh, and then in a possible expansion, uh, I might do uh, another yard in Jersey City, which is where a lot of them came and went as well. So the idea is to have these on carts, and they are, they are on carts right now, but um, to have them movable and then connect up to the layout. Uh, and since I don't have to worry about electricity, it makes it you know, a little bit simpler to, to do that. But I need some sort of nice um, positive locking system so that the, um, you know, the rails line up and it, it, there's no fiddling with it. It's just you put it into place and it works. Um, so that's, that's going to be really neat, too, um, to be able to actually basically restage during a session and just have that on a continuous loop. So, you know, I, I could operate indefinitely uh, by using car floats like that. Cool. You could even have a spare, a few spares somewhere else, you know, in yes. transit. Yep. So do you have any staging or is the main yard pre-staged? Um, so the, the main yard is, is where things come and go, yes. Um, the connection with the Erie is really my staging. Um, since the, the Hoboken Shore only connects to the Erie and a car float, those are the staging areas. And that's where cars come on the layout and go off of the layout. The, the Erie yard right now uh, you know, only holds um, like a dozen cars or so, um, which in most of my operating sessions, you know, quite frankly, because there's so much to do in the yard and switching the industries and everything, that's never been an issue of needing more staging. Um, but I would like to, I would like to have a little bit more. So um, there's, um, it, it's a little bit easier to to move cars on and off and have that be a little bit more efficient. But basically, I only need you know 12 cars there, and then each of the car floats um, will. Right now, they hold six cars. Um, but I'll go up to, to larger car floats and, you know, maybe handle nine or, or 11. Okay. And then uh, someone asked if you, would you ever backdate some sessions to model World War II or a year prior to 1959? I have not yet, but that is definitely a desire of mine. The, okay. the Hoboken Shore, like so many railroads, had a lot of ups and downs over the years. And World War II was a, um, was a boom for them. Um, servicemen came and went through um, uh, the ocean liner uh, piers, uh, you know, tanks and trucks and, and ammo and everything uh, were loaded up onto ships and went across the Atlantic from there. So World War II was the height of the Hoboken shore. Uh, so that would be really interesting to get into and, you know, then I could model uh, World War II is, is another uh, interest area of mine. Um, I grew up studying World War II and playing games and, and whatnot. Uh, so that would be a lot of fun to be able to model, you know, Sherman tanks loading at the docks, um, having a bunch of troops lined up, embarking or, or disembarking. Uh, so that is, yeah, that's in the back of my mind, but I need to, um, I need to get the scenery done. I need to, I've got a, a lot of buildings to build and all my buildings are going to be scratch built. So, um, you know, I'm working for prototype photos and so that's going to take a while. Um, and, uh, you know, that'll keep me busy for a while before I start backdating things. So last question I see here, any plans for backdrops? Uh, yes. Um, that's, that's what I'm grappling with right now. Uh, I've been, I've been looking at some different ways of doing that. Um, you know, with backdrops, you, you kind of range from uh, doing an abstract painting, um, or I guess, you know, really you can go all the way back to just a blank wall, which is what I have right now, uh, but doing some sort of abstract painting of scenery, um, you know, keeping it, keep, keeping it uh, low on detail and more general, you know, feel of what's going on, more artistic interpretation. You can go from there all the way up to, you know, photo backdrops. And so I've been thinking about, you know, where on that spectrum I really want to be and what that does to the buildings and the scenery that I'm going to have because it's obviously, you know, really, really close to it. 
Um, and there's some interesting challenge with the challenges with the prototype having the, the Palisades uh, right behind there as well that need to be represented. So I thought about all those. And then I've also thought about getting into uh, projecting backdrops from a computer and uh, from an LED projector. Uh, this would allow a more artistic interpretation um, and then have, um, you know, slight motion in them. So clouds right. could move, airplanes could go by, subtle things that wouldn't distract you, but would immerse you in that. Um, so that and, and LED screens, um, there are display screens that are used in exhibits um, that are appropriate here. So I'm just kind of scratching the surface there and I'm starting to make contact with people who do this for a living uh, to see if it could be adapted for my situation. So stay tuned for that. So we would like to encourage everybody to go over to uh, webby.com forward slash MRL dash Aussies. Uh, and if Riley has time, then he can mm -hmm. uh, answer some more questions there and maybe enlighten a few people about the new digital publication that we are attempting to do. So please fill in your survey as well. And yes, uh, since I've operated on Riley's uh, railroad myself quite a number of times, it's still a favorite. Thank you very, very much for giving us a clinic today. And uh, I believe the audience is also uh, quite uh, uh, happy with your your uh, enlightenment excellent thank you for having me speed be safe you too see you soon Hi, this is uh, Big Bill coming from uh, MRL, Model Railroading Live America. If you guys have been watching the NMRAX and enjoy it, you guys should hit the sub button, hit the like button, and also the notification so you'll know every time they come on with a, uh, with a show. Greatly appreciate it. You take care and God bless.